Every semester, the Natural Resources Ecology class, SOE 300 of Washington State University, takes a field trip to experience, firsthand, the natural forested ecosystems at Kamiak View County Park. Located only 15 miles north of the Pullman campus, this unique butte stands on quartzite substrate, fractured and compressed by eons of time and pressures to be surrounded by the basalt floods which covered virtually all of eastern Washington, along with parts of Idaho and Oregon. Then, as the most recent global ice age began its climatological shift to warmer climates about 17,000 years ago, the Bonneville floods released billions of cubic meters of ice melt lake floodwaters to scour the lands of the Snake River Basin from Utah to Astoria, Oregon. Then, glacial Lake Missoula was released through hundreds of years of consecutive flood events to scour eastern Washington lands to make another wet dam of accumulation at the Wallula Gap, just south of Kennewick, Washington. The winds from the Pacific Ocean blew the wet dam topsoil accumulation from their temporary resting place to new downwind homes to places like the Palouse Hills and Kamiak Butte. This incredibly productive topsoil layer covers Kamiak Butte, but the underlying quartzite soils leach the moisture through this substrate, making water availability a scarce resource for the trees, shrubs, and wildlife living here. The Natural Resource Ecology class visits Kamiak Butte to experience, firsthand, ecological interactions and the differential of north aspect versus south aspect microclimates. Along with physical site characteristic data, student teams are collecting tree core samples from randomly selected field sample locations and trees to determine carbon and nitrogen sequestration amounts, one tree at a time. Carbon sequestration has dominated scientific discussions for half a century, and this field trip experience guides all students through discovery of what this big topic means for Little Kamiak Butte, happening right here in WSU's front yard and using the scientific tools and people deployed on this campus. Here, we make it happen. The tools that you will need in order to take the tree core samples are an increment borer, labeling sticker, straw to store the samples in, pen to label the sample for your group, tape, and a measuring tape. After gathering your tools and getting to your site, the first thing you do is mark the center of your plot. Then find the first tree that is within the radius of your plot. You can probably just spike that in there too. Oh, yeah. So that's hitting. No, take zero. it all around zero to zero. the zero. Yeah. Now you can read that off as what? You've got 26 inches. You know, 27's here. So you're going to the zero marker. That's intense. One, two, three, four, five, six. 26.6 six inches is its diameter. Okay. This will be the tree you take the core sample from. Then take the increment borer and remove the bill and extractor from the handle. Place the extractor on the side of the tree by sticking the sharp end into the bark and letting it hang there. Attach the bill to the handle and lock it in place. Then measure 4.5 feet for best height in order to get to where the center of the tree is. Then place the bill into the tree at breast height and start twisting to the right until you are halfway into the tree. You can use the extractor to see how far you are by placing the extractor on the side of the tree to show it is halfway. Then place the extractor into the hole in the middle of the handle, but do this slowly and carefully in order to not bend the extractor. The next step is to turn the handle twice to the left until the handle is vertical. Once you have put the core sample into the straw and taped the other end, you can either hang the extractor on the tree or have one of your group members hold on to it. 
Then remove the bill by turning it to the left until it is fully removed from the tree. Next, remove the bill from the handle. There may be another piece of the tree stuck in the top of the bill. You can just leave it there for now, and when you take your next core sample in the south aspect of the butte, just remember that this will be the first piece in the next core sample, and just remove it before placing the sample into the straw. Or you can use the sharp end of the extractor and carefully pop it out. This step helps to avoid contamination and give you accurate results when it is dried and grinded. Then place the extractor in the bill and the bill into the handle and lock it up so it looks like it did when you first started to travel to the next site on the south aspect of Kamiak. Then tape the other end to avoid dropping the sample on the ground. Then repeat these steps for the south aspect. On that, you're going to be able to look at the growth rings that are showing up on that whole core. This is how you do tree age. This, you might uh, actually put a, a scale on there and say, I want the outer inch. How many growth rings does it have? Okay, this is all how we would take that x-ray and start to use it. Now, looking at that uh, increment core you pulled out, look at the far end of it, the older stuff. You see pieces of the bark. Oh, right over here. Oh, right here, okay. Yeah. You see the bark uh, for that tree. You're not gonna put that into your capsule. We're not gonna save it and do mass spectrometry on the bark. So you're going to just gently pick that off and right there you see the cambium layer. Hmm. Okay. You, that is the active that xylem right folium. Yeah. The active xylem folium of the tree. It's right out here, this outer edge of the tree. And that is, that's what lets the water go up and down? Yes. Xylem takes it up, folium brings it down. So xylem is pushing up your nitrogen, your folium is pushing down the carbon. Okay. Okay. And that's why the trees right now, they're pushing up to get all the nutrients down from the in the ground up to the tree going into active growth and that's exactly where it's hitting in okay why the cambium is so tasty right now to a lot of the fall. deer and the oh, yeah. i'm sorry to the bears and the other critters who eat it Ready okay let's go ahead and feed that in i would just push it all the way yeah there we go now it's too long or is it going to fit all it should, uh, fit. It should fit just all right. barely all right you can just twist it upside down and then push it off. Oh. Why is it not coming off? Mm -hmm. Okay, pull it all the way out and uh, put it in with your hands. I think it's like stuck to the front of it. Yeah, there's some grips on it that are, are meant to grab it. There we go. They just did their job That's a the way. too well. <laughs> oh no, we did our job too well. <laughs> There we go. Perfect. All right. Always have that problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> I need that problem. All right. Well, then we just pull this right out. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just slide it right out there. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. Sounds like you're in the Navy. <laughs> How far? Just you're going to go all the way in because you want to get to the center of that tree, which means. Well, maybe three quarters of the way in, but don't stop along your way or it's going to be really tough to get the core out. Nice and constant. Good boy. And you're aimed for the center of the tree, right? Yes. It's got a nice noise. In the fall time, you get it just right and you get a squeal out of it. It's like you're bugling elk. <laughs> it's fun. I've been on trees up near an area called Lost Lake. Yeah, yeah. you've been there. Yeah. Oh. I did it up on Strawberry Mountain, so we're up on the top. Okay, when you get right about here, I want you to end with it vertical. Your handle's vertical. Good. Okay, now take your extractor. Slide it in nice and gentle, straight. Don't put any bend on it. <laughs> You're going to impact some wood pretty soon, and you're just going to be constant push, nice and straight. Excellent. Is it going more than that? As far as you can. Okay. Now, extract one turn. Uh, like backwards? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Left. Yeah. <laughs> Lucy. <laughs> 
Okay, now both of you get in there with your hands underneath because if she pulls that out, there's a big chance that parts of that core are gonna fall and dribble out. Now, my hands are so shaky. I'm afraid it's gonna like. It's not, it's gonna come out super slow and not easy. Oh. Okay, now pause. <laughs> yeah, you set the stage. Hey, show the uh, camera your uh, your core. Ta -da. Da -da -da -da. Okay. Awesome. Oh, wait, Joy, I put it in and then I yes. go back. Is your extractor cup up? No. Dip it until it is. There you go. You have the label to put on the. off the extractor because the teeth at the end of the extractor will try to hold it in place. Okay. Just so you, yeah, you feed in exactly that. Yeah. You got it. And then I'll pinch it if you want to snap it. It could be worse. <laughs> could be porcupine needles. Do you have labels? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I give them okay. Back. You gave them back? Did we have one for the end? Uh, no, I'm waiting on it. Six degrees for one day or two days? Um, at least one day, I would say. Uh -huh. Okay. We'll do it. All right. Okay. 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 Ok
You know, the, that's usually the uh, the one that sets me off first, but uh, now that I put it between the cheek and gum, that's when you really get to do it. <laughs> In order to prepare the sample for mass spectrometry, first transfer the core samples from the containing swirls into labeled paper bags. Place these bags into the drying oven for 24 to 72 hours at 60 to 75 degrees Celsius. Remove the samples and grind them each into a fine powder. Place each powdered sample into a labeled container to be processed. A mass spectrometer combusts a sample into gas and measures the amount of different mass of the atoms in the gas. We are using a coupled system which includes an elemental analyzer, EA, and a isotope ratio mass spectrometer, IRMS. The EA combusts the sample and separates the atoms in that gas. The IRMS is a machine that bends atoms along their flight path when in a vacuum using a strong magnet which allows detectors to precisely measure the amount of different atoms slash masses present. Different versions of a single atom can be detected, and these are called isotopes. The samples gathered at Kamiak after being dried and ground will be wrapped in tin and placed in the auto sampler in the EA. If you look in the photo, you can see samples in the auto sampler that are being prepared for the next step of the process. These samples are dropped in the EA and combusted into gas. The gas travels through the chemical filters to filter out most of the components in the gas except the carbon and nitrogen. This filtered gas is then filtered again through a long physical filter to space out the cloud of the nitrogen versus carbon so that it can be seen and measured them separately. This gas is funneled into the IRMS through these hollow wires. The wires that transfer the gas are the same thickness as a human hair. The cloud of nitrogen and carbon are exposed to a strong magnet. This magnet separates the isotopes by weight. The lighter isotopes bend further towards the magnet and the heavier isotopes don't bend as close to the magnet. After this separation, the isotopes are counted, separated through the passage through the detectors. This data is received as electronic signals. This is compared to known reference material. The carbon and nitrogen amounts are then inferred from the unknown samples, and this data can be used in research. A box of samples that Dr. Bill provided me from your class. So you have your cores that have been taken out of the trees and they are individually bagged and they've been dried in an oven to get them as dry as possible first. So what I'm working with kind of looks like broken up cork or pencils. It's very, very brittle. And honestly, the way that is best to grind material like this is a coffee grinder. This is just a home use coffee grinder from the store. Um, it does a really good job though of turning something solid into a powder. So I'm wearing gloves. It's always good to try and keep materials between samples clean. I'm gonna not even touch them. I'm just sticking them directly into the coffee grinder. I'm gonna prepare my bag so I can dump it in there when it's ready. It works really well. I feel like I'm doing a cooking show right now. It works really well to be on a black countertop. 
Um, anytime you're doing processing like this, it's good to make considerations about where you could cross contaminate samples, where you could mix things up. And working on a black countertop lets me see all the dust that I can't help but is gonna fall off of this. But at least I will know what to wipe down and I will know what to be careful of to keep samples from crossing into one another. So the sample is in the coffee grinder and I'm just gonna if just continuously grinding or pulsing it is better. But the bottom line is we want to get it as finely powdered as possible. When you're running a sample, and the samples we're going to run are teeny, teeny, tiny, teeny, teeny, teeny little powdered samples, and we're trying to make that little tiny sample represent all of what came out of that bag, the best way to make sure that the sample represents something larger is to homogenize it, meaning to make it even throughout, make it tiny particles, so that when I take a small subsample of this, it's going to be a very good mix of what the entire larger sample was. So I'm just grinding, grinding. It actually smells really good. It smells like, it smells like a lumber yard in here. Whatever you guys think. Oh, it's conifers. So you can start to see it's getting ground up. It gets really staticky. So it is the moment I take this lid off, it's going to go flying everywhere. It does get very staticky, and that's one of the hazards of using this method. I'm also going to do an experiment to see how that goes. About the same. Trial and error, right? Alright. Okay, so I went with grinding just continuously for maybe a minute, minute and a half. And unfortunately, one thing that does happen with a very dry sample, which we have to have, and a coffee grinder, which is the easiest, simplest way to do this, is it gets really, really staticky. Um, I'm even seeing just wiping my glove along the surface is causing some static tension under the lid that's moving the particles around. There's not really any way that I know around that because if you introduce moisture, that's horrible for sample preservation in the machine. So we need it dry. Um, we just are going to see a big puff of sample and a tricky time getting it into the bag. But here it goes. Okay, so I'm going to do the best I can to get powder into the bag. So I can do it so you can see. And mostly it just wants to be statically stuck to the scoopula, but for science, right? So we just kind of do what we can to get as much of that nice fine powder into the baggie and it just takes time patience and time and keeping yourself back at a distance from the sample is always important and it doesn't look like a lot came out of there but honestly honestly what i have in the bag is probably already about half as much as I would need for an analysis. So we're on a good roll. That's actually a good thing, but we have all that. So we're gonna go ahead and take whatever we can out of the coffee grinder. Some of the particles are still pretty big. Um, without burning out the motor of our coffee grinder, I know I have enough fine powder, so I'm not going to grind this for an hour. Um, and I'm assuming that enough of the big chunks have been powdered that we have lots of fine powder representing lots and lots of portions of the core that we sampled. So this is giving us plenty of material. It really doesn't look like much going into the bag and there is a lot going everywhere else and sticking to the container. But honestly, we're looking for such a small amount of sample that 
there will be some losses. This is also a really good moment to realize when you are taking samples of anything, whatever it may be, always want extra, lots and lots of extra because steps are gonna chip away at your total amount. Carefully flipping this over. So I just wanted to give you a quick view of what sample weighing looks like once we've got our samples all ground into a powder. This is my lab's weighing station. Um, the tool that we use to make very, very small samples is called a microbalance. Um, it's one of the highest resolution types of balances you can use to weigh out very small size things. It actually is automated with draft shields so that when you're working with very tiny, very staticky things, the sample is very protected from any cross contamination of dust, of wind blowing it around, of um, we don't even have to use our hands to touch the device. It's just operated by waving a hand over a sensor here. When we're preparing them, we prepare them on a mirror. Um, the use for that is it helps you see any dust that has fallen out of the capsule. It helps you make sure that the capsule, if it's losing dust after you've created it, um, you can see all the little particles on the mirror. It's backlit. And then this is a look at just how tiny we're trying to put these guys into. It's like miniature origami. Each of these is a little cup. Think of like a muffin tin, but for elves or something. Um, they're made out of tin, it's super combustible, which will come into play when we burn the sample up. And these are completed samples. These are your guys' actual first five class samples that were wrapped up by one of our trained technicians last night. And this is what we do. We weigh out a sample on the balance into a little tin. We roll it up inside that tin into a little ball. And we have a chart that maps out the cells in this tray and we record the name of the sample and the weight that the microbalance showed us what is inside the tin capsule. So that is creating samples for analysis on an EA IRMS. Hey class, so we're back with day number three of getting your samples run through an EA IRMS to find out the percent carbon and percent nitrogen composition of your organic matter. And basically at this point, you've collected your samples, they were oven dried, they've all been ground, they've all been weighed out on our microbalance. So at this time, the samples are sitting here in our cute little tray. And when they were weighed out, we have basically here a road map of what is in each of the cells of this tray to hold the samples. You can see they're really, really tiny. Here's my hand for comparison. Each one of those silver balls is a sample rolled up in tin. And at this point, the next step is simply to turn this road map into a digital file for our computer. So that's what I have here. This is the submission form for my lab. Um, it has a client name and a project when it was started, what we're gonna be analyzing for, 
and I've actually translated your sample names into something a little bit more complicated, just that has to do with the software we're gonna be using. But basically we're turning your weights and what you're weighing and the name of each sample into information for our software that's gonna be running the mass spec. So that's coming up next. Hey again, everybody. So we have now made it to the step where all of our samples are prepped. We've digitized everything into a file to be used uh, in our software that runs our elemental analyzer and our isotope ratio mass spectrometer. And here are the actual devices. So the littler one up on top is the elemental analyzer, the EA. And that one through some tubes is connected to this much bigger box down below the IRMS or the isotope ratio mass spectrometer. They're very, very loud. So I apologize. That's the sound of some vacuum pumps um, taking this down to as close to a full vacuum as possible. It makes a really loud noise constantly. So I apologize if the sound is bad, but here is our list of samples printed out. We have everything digitized here. We have some standards that I filled in. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time explaining the theory on what standards we're running your samples against, but basically this is a list of what I have loaded into the elemental analyzer and what we're gonna run through our system. And here's what it looks like when we have samples all loaded up. This is the tray that they came out of. And here's our auto sampler. And this is a bunch of samples lined up in the carousel ready to go. As this operates, every time a new sample drops, it's simply going to advance clockwise one space. And there's one open spot in the auto sampler here. And whatever gets pushed over that opening, it's about once every 10 minutes, that's gonna drop down through the flight tube here and be on its way down into the first oven and be going through a whole combustion path, a whole chemical pathway in the elemental analyzer. At that point, it's now in gas form, and then it's gonna go down into the mass spec. So that is a little snapshot of getting our samples loaded. We'll close, uh, where's my finger? We'll close the top hatch here. And once that is closed and we do a bunch of systems checks and everything looks good, we'll start burning through samples. Okay, so this should be our final video. Uh, at this point, our samples loaded up in the device. Here's the back side of the device. This gives you a good view of just how much equipment it takes to run an EA IRMS. Those are our standalone devices. This is our backup battery in case the building has power issues. All the way over to here, here's my island where I have a computer running the software that tells our machinery what to do. And here is our software, like our control center for the mass spec. Here's all of our samples typed in. Shows you a sample running. And on my other monitor, this is what a data file looks like for an EA RMS. So you can actually see we have right here, this electronic trace is our puff of nitrogen. And this electronic trace is our puff of carbon that came out of actual samples that we ran for you guys. So very, very exciting at this point. I will download the numbers that represent those electronic traces. And those are the signals of your samples and we'll turn them into data. All right, you guys, so last look, our whole EAIRMS -E station and we've got data to talk about. Nice work, everybody. What data will the samples give us? The samples themselves and the data derived from the mass spectrometry process will show the net differences in carbon and nitrogen compositions of trees of the north aspect versus the south aspect of Kamiak View. While it may make sense to hypothesize that the north-facing aspect would have higher concentrations of carbon and nitrogen, the two aspects are remarkably similar. We can conclude that the markable differences are the biomass present on each aspect. 
How to use the data. To use the data obtained from mass spectrometry analysis, compare the concentrations of nitrogen and carbon between core samples from both aspects. While comparing, note the biomass associated with each sample from each aspect. Create a ratio to compare the two aspects. Note that the ratio is similar across both aspects and the difference comes from the differences in biomass. On the north side of Kamiak Butte, there is a lot more plant life. There are many factors affecting this, with carbon and nitrogen playing a big part. Nitrogen is needed in order to make chloroplasts, which in turn uses CO2 to do photosynthesis. To acquire nitrogen, plants can absorb it from the roots along with water from humus. Humus is a part of soil that is composed of decaying plant matter. Nitrogen is fixed by bacteria that breaks down the plant matter. With the north side having a lot more trees, shrubs, and grasses, more humus will accumulate on the ground. This allows nitrogen to be cycled back into the soil a lot quicker than the south side. This is good for the plants because while carbon is always there for the plants to take up, nitrogen may not be as accessible. Here are the reasons as to why the north and south side have such different looks. With the south side not having as many plants, nitrogen is not as readily available, and it shows. Not only does the south side not have as much humus so that nitrogen can collect more, it is also more susceptible to leaching, losing more nitrogen as it goes further into the ground. The north aspect has adapted to this, having humus that absorbs a lot of water. Being on quartzite, this is also needed because quartzite is very permeable and loses water quickly. Humus, with the added benefit of low soils on the north side, is what allows the north aspect to be so rich with life. Now let's talk about carbon and why it is important. Carbon is needed by plants in order to make the sugars that plants use. These sugars are made through a process called photosynthesis. These sugars are used to carry out cellular processes within plant cells. The amount of carbon will differ on the north and south aspect, even though carbon is readily available for both sides. Nitrogen is needed to make the chloroplast, which is what takes the carbon in. There is more nitrogen on the north side, so there are more chloroplasts, and the trees will take up more carbon. This can be seen based on the size of the trees as well. The north aspect trees are a lot larger than the ones on the southern side, and the larger the tree, the more chloroplasts it will have. More chloroplasts means there will be a higher percentage of carbon.